you're going next, so maybe you sit here and then we can. I'm in charge of the computers. <laughs> Ich weiß nicht, was die, die Reihenfolge von der Remote Also, Herr Kring? Ja, ich schicke es, glaube ich. Genau, wir machen schon Platz. Und dann ich, glaube ich, Herr Schneider und. Yes, so we can. Yeah, maybe. We are just to move. Maybe I can move over here. Then we are, exactly, then we are in order. So you first, yeah. then okay. I go second and third. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which order? Hi. Do you need anything from us? Really from the technique? Um, weiß ich gar nicht. Um, ich glaube nicht, ich kann, ich kann nicht. Nee, ich nicht. Das ist ja ein spannendes Projekt, diese Charter. Ich bin sehr gespannt. Also machen wir jetzt eher mal eine Diskussionsrunde. Ja, mit, mit Eingangsstatements, die kann man aber auf dem Platz ausmachen, mhm. glaube ich. Genau, ja, ja. Das ist noch gar nicht genug. Okay, danke. Easy, easy Panel. Ja, ich hatte noch nichts davon gehört, aber jetzt habe ich es gelesen. Können wir jetzt Platz tauschen, damit ich in der Mitte sitze? Ich genau, ich wollte nur gerade gefragt. Achso, okay. Allerdings sitzen wir jetzt im Web. Mann getrennt. Deswegen wollten vielleicht wir uns trennen voneinander. Genau. Vielleicht, oder wir vielleicht tauschen. Äh, ich kann auch tauschen. So, ich kann auch woanders hingehen. Vielleicht kannst du das Okay, ja, da natürlich. Dann, dann, dann sitzen wir nicht so. Alright. Gender geht. Hier hin, alles gut. Eins, zwei, eins, zwei, eins. In der Europäischen Union. Eins, zwei. Ich weiß nicht gar nicht, also ich bin Frau Hörerstock und Frau Kuhn, ich, genau, weil ich, ich kenne das Thema, aber ich kenne nicht die einzelnen konkreten Inhalte. Ich glaube, das geht. Ähm, Haben wir Stimme? Also der ist, welche, der ist noch relativ im frühen Stadium. Ne? Genau, ja, der ja. soll ja jetzt so eine Public Consultation Phase. Also es wird wahrscheinlich nicht mehr unsere Ratspräsidentschaft eine große Rolle spielen, sonst können wir natürlich auch als Input was, was mitnehmen hier. hier. Also, da ich ja von, von der Sprecher und Referat da. Liegt ja an der Qualität der Vorschläge. Ja, ja, genau, richtig. Achso, äh, ah, nee, ich glaube, es gab tatsächlich nur. Vielleicht ist es nachher nochmal gelaufen. Schau, wie es läuft. Sonst laufe ich nochmal schnell raus und hole zwei Wasser. Ja, das sind die Gläser sind rechts und links ist der Wasserspender. Ja. Okay. Julia, ich suche das Wasser. We're just waiting for our last speaker to come back. So, one more minute. Super, thank you. <laughs> so now, perfect. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Um, this is the session on as a stakeholder in digital society, can civil society make its voice heard, which is organized by the German Ministry of the Interior. My name is Julia Pole. I'm from the Berlin Social Science Center and I will be the moderator of this session. I'm very happy that you all made it here and you made it through the queues. Uh, we probably have some more audience dropping in um, during the session once they made it through the registration. 
Um, but I'm happy that you all made it here on the first day uh, this early morning. Um, before I, I, I dive into the topic of the session, I would like to introduce um, the panel I have here with me. Um, first of all, we have uh, Günther Krings, who is Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Ministry of the Interior. Welcome. And then we have on my left side, we have uh, Danny Stockmann, who's a professor for digital governance at the Berlin-based Hertie School for Governance. Thanks for being here. And then on my right side, we have Maria Maciel, who is a digital policy senior researcher at Diplo Foundation, based in Strasbourg. Thanks for being here. And then we have, last but not least, um, Daniel Opper, who's a program director, Buceros Lab at the Zeitstiftung. Thanks for all of you to, for being here with us this morning. So of course, um, the topic of like, the relationship between society, citizens, and the digital transformation is a, a very up-to-date topic. It has been discussed um, in many occasions, and it will be discussed during this IGF. So what we will focus on today in this session is actually not how the digital transformation is impacting society or citizens' life, but rather how we as citizens and how civil society can make an impact or can have an influence on how the digital transformation is shaped in our democratic societies, but also in more authoritarian states um, as China or other countries around the world. Um, so what I would like to discuss is really the questions, how can society influence the digital transformation? Uh, and the, the way we see the digital transformation, but also what should be the values behind the digital transformation. So what kind of values do we actually want to promote as civil society, as citizens, when it comes to influencing kind of policy making about the digital transformation or also technology making about the digital transformation. So how can we as civil society contribute to a value-based and public interest-oriented digital transformation? So that's basically the main question behind this panel. Uh, and we will have occasions to um, discuss this here on the panel, but we will also open uh, the panel to the um, audience so that you can make your comments uh, and bring forward your ideas and you can ask, ask questions to our panelists. Um, so we already are a little bit running a bit late, so I will start immediately. We have a couple of uh, initial uh, kind of position statements um, from our panelists. So I would like to invite uh, Mr. Krings uh, to talk about the position of the German Ministry of the Interior on this topic. Uh, and how also the ministry might to kind of promote citizen influence on the transformation in Germany and in Europe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very uh, much, ladies and gentlemen. The title of today's event is a, st is a Stakeholder in the Digital Society, How Can Civil Society Make Its Voice Heard? So I think one could ask why civil society in recent years, the international debates surrounding internet governance uh, have shifted from technical questions to socio political issues, and that's, I think, why this topic is very important. The digital transformation is constantly opening up new ways to participate and make an impact for citizens, as well, of course, as for business, the research community, public administration. We have new business models that are being developed and new means of participating in society which are emerging. The digital single market created the regulatory framework for promoting digital technologies, infrastructure, digital public administration, new technologies, and also generally digital literacy. The long-term uh, success of a European single market based on digital technology now hinges on the success of the digital transformation of the European Union. And this transformation brings new socio-political challenges and opportunities with it. So we must ask ourselves the following questions, and this list is not uh, a final list, but let's just state these four, four questions. What sort of digital world do we want to live in? Secondly, how can we bring about a values-based digital transformation? Third, what effect will the digital transformation have on existing democratic structures and on how and, uh, our citizens view themselves? Four, how can we ensure that all of our citizens can participate in the digital world on their own terms? And I think you can enlarge this list, but let's uh, stick to these four points. To help find the answers of these questions, society needs a compass to navigate the transformation process. But we do not need to start from scratch, of course, to create this compass. We have been discussing these uh, issues for decades. In a debate that reflects, for example, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and many other documents. To echo the technical jargon, we do not need a new version of our values, but rather an update of our existing values. 
This is clearly demonstrated by efforts, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, to draw up a European Union Charter of Fundamental Digital Rights. And I think it also, uh, we talked about this, set certain limits uh, to this endeavor, seeing that these rights are not made from scratch, but they are certainly um, um, an add-on to existing human rights that have been developed internationally and nationally. And I think uh, we will hear, hear more from Mr. Opper a little bit later. However, the debate on what this update should um, look like tends to take place, of course, mainly at the level of governments, also at the digital, in the digital economy, also in the research community. The only members of civil society who try and contribute are generally part of a quite small pool of digital pioneers, individuals, whitehead hackers, and some digital think tanks. I certainly do not want to play down their importance, but their voices only represent, I think, a small, rather small segment of our civil society. Our aim for the digital world is for everyone to benefit from the opportunities offered by digital technology. No one should be left by the wayside. We as a government, together with all the governments in Europe, must think about what sort of digital transformation our citizens actually want. That includes finding ways to make sure that we listen to those voices that have not been heard up to now for whatever reason. Advancing the digital transformation in Europe for the benefit of society as a whole will be a key point of Germany's EU presidency in the second half of 2020. So I think the IGF comes to Germany at just the right time. And um, the Internet Governance Forum is a space for a really truly political debate. We will not be able to come up with new ideas if we do not discuss these socio-political risks and challenges with international partners from really around the globe. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion, the discussion today, but for, of uh, all the other discussions also here at this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, we actually do have a pen problem on the podium because three out of uh, four do not work. If anyone has an extra pen, you can borrow it <laughs> us for this session and would be very much appreciated. Um, yeah, he needs one first. Thank you. Um, so we heard um, a lot about about the German. We heard, or like Mr. Kings mentioned, the German initiative um, that was born two or three years ago about a, developing a, a digital charter. And I would actually like to follow up immediately on this. Uh, I would like inv invite Daniel Opper, who was one of the people behind this initiative, to report on this uh, and see how this initiative was actually kind of a way to promote values um, developed by citizens and individuals uh, and promote this on the German and the European level. Thank you so much. First of all, yeah, this is a real um, paperless conference. I think they <laughs> took off the <laughs> pens. Now we are in the digital age. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, oh, there's a pen coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for us having the opportunity also to join this kind of converse, uh, conversation as a civil society actor, as we are, as a Zeit Foundation, Zeit Stiftung from Hamburg. Um, and um, yeah, we are, there's a long way to go. And first of all, also thank you so much for recognizing this uh, Winter Krings um, um, in your opening statement, um, um, our initiative. And it may be the first point. Uh, to the headline of um, the panel is from our point of view or from my point of view, um, yes, we need a discussion about values and a value-based internet pro or digital progress civilization. Um, but values are good, but, it's but they are hard to enforce if it comes to conflict. I just come back from Silicon Valley where we presented this digital charter on fundamental rights in Silicon Valley and at the institution Stanford and also at Facebook. In the same week, um, um, Mark Zuckerberg um, said that um, he will decide not to take away um, uh, political ads from his platform that show clear um, lies. So um, <coughs> at the same year when he stated publicly that yeah, Facebook, there were some scandals, so we will do better, we will create value charters, we will create an external oversight <laughs> board and so on. But at the same time, or we have to recognize that at the end, it's still this company who decides what they understand 
and values. So recognizing this, the idea of this charter initi initiative is that we have to define as societies certain values, not just for the internet, but for the whole future of digitalization, AI, networked society, smart cities, and so on, privacy, of course, um, and what kind of world, on, on what kind of values, or Western values, we would like to rely. And we have to transform, the, transport them into a legally binding document, not just having guidelines or external oversight boards. And this was the idea when we came together, or we as Site Foundation, we, inv we didn't do this in our back room, but or in my office, but, <laughs> but we invited, what you said in the opening statement, a broad variety. And also what Mr. Krinks said, what is important, not just one kind of, of expert groups or um, 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 advocacy group, but a huge variety of representatives of civil society, from writers, from scientists, fr uh, uh, from, um, of course, net, net activists or net ec experts, but also writers, um, lawyers, politicians, and so on, uh, even from the church and the media companies and from economy, um, to sit together and, first of all, um, try to create this common ground on what should, if we ta are talking maybe in comparison to the children rights charter, what are these basic values that we want to protect, that we want to enforce, or that we, we're, that we knew have to come up with, which are not yet in our Grundgesetz or um, European rights charter written down. And so what came out is this document, 2016, first version. We, yes, of course, we got the group, or we got a lot of criticism on, on content or ex, uh, ex aspects of it, or f let's say feedback from, from a huge um, public um, process of um, negotiation. We went to public conference like Republica. We had more than 400 um, uh, mm -hmm. feedbacks from the net community and we converged them into a second <coughs> version which we presented last year to the uh, federal minister of um, Katarina Barley and to your ministry and um, this is what we uh, this is to sum it up the the point where we are it's still a draft proposal it's not a legally binded yet but um, as a foundation we would like um, to 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 stick to this long-term goal uh, that we need a consensus that at the end, as a global community, we need such an amendment in the whole um, orchestra of binding documents on European, international, UN maybe level um, at the long-term end. And I'm very happy that this charter was also mentioned in the Koalitionsvertrag, in the Coalition Agreement. Um, so um, I, I, I guess that we have, at least our government in Germany, as a sparing partner or supporting partner for moving on with other groups um, on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I saw you brought some copies, so I think people yes, will probably yes, um, have um, the possibility <laughs> to get a copy and read through the document and what is actually written in there. Um, thank you very much. Um, following up on this, this, this is a very concrete initiative about how we can actually promote a certain rights and certain values. And I would like to follow up immediately with uh, Maria, who is from Brazil and who was involved in a very similar or in some way similar initiative um, a couple of years ago in Brazil, the Marco Civil framework. And I would actually like to also ask you, because I mean, you now make a point for making this document binding. I would also like to know what this is kind of, what, what was, I mean, was the, do the Brazilian document binding? Uh, was it not? I mean, if it's not, what are the consequences now a couple of years later? Uh, what can you see from a couple of years distance? Uh, what happened with this document? Thank you, Yule, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you, a, ple ple a pleasure to be here with you and everyone. Um, it is a binding document, the Marco Civil, which translates into English as a civil rights framework for the internet in Brazil. It's a federal law which, aim, which aims to govern the use of the internet in Brazil. It establishes basic principles and rights and responsibilities of the users of the internet, and also establishes some guidelines uh, for the public sector. 
Um, this law was approved in 2014, which gives us some insights and gives us the possibility to extract some lessons that we learned from 2014 until now. But what is special about this bill and why do I think it can offer lessons to the process that we are discussing here of civil society participation? Well, first of all, the bill was the fruit of civil society mobilization. It was first proposed as a reaction to a very draconian cyber a law that was proposed in Congress that tried to criminalize behaviors that are considered very normal in the online environment and punish them with harsh penalties that disrespected privacy. So civil society mobilized offline and online and created a campaign against this bill and it forced the Brazilian government at the time to engage in a more positive agenda. So the stance that civil society had was before we criminalize behaviors online, let's discuss what are the basic rights and responsibilities that people have online. And the government took the proposal and it decided to take it one step further. If we are going to do it, then let's do it in a very open and participatory way. And they decided to draft the bill from scratch um, in a process of online consultation. So the consultation was organized in two rounds. In the first round, people decided what, what were the principles that they wanted to see enshrined in the law. So it was more a high-level discussion. In the second round, the participants were able to take these principles into very concrete uh, legal text. So we're talking about really discussing the, the letter of the articles of the law. And they did discuss very thorny issues such as network neutrality and the limits of responsibility of internet intermediaries. So that was all conducted online. And what I think is interesting is that the process was, was open. There were no controlled questions because sometimes when we put a document under public consultation, uh, the public authority that is uh, proposing the consultation creates the questions. And the users are very confined to a yes or no answer. Do I like this bill? I don't like this bill. And that was a process in which civil society really was able to write the law from scratch. So they had liberty to really put in the law what they wanted to see happening for the internet in Brazil. <coughs> of course, there were limits to this experiment, and we are seeing these limits right now. The first one was very clear. The participation was expressive from different sectors of society, not only civil society, but companies participated too, the technical community. But still, when we look at the population in Brazil, we, we still have a little bit more than half of the population connected, and there's, there's a huge disconnect in the country. So of course, an online consultation was limited in scope to those that were connected that could participate. This is why it is very important that a consultation like this is revised by Congress. So after the consultation, when the bill was ready, it was sent to Congress, and then we came across a second obstacle, which was the fact that the Congress received the result of the consultation, and it stayed dormant in Congress for years. And they did not take any measure on that because we absolutely had no fast track, no special procedure that gave a, sort of a more legitimacy to a bill that was so much discussed before in society. And I think it is the same in, in our countries. We do not have in our, in our traditional democratic systems procedures and to really embrace these this bills or proposals that come with big uh, public support. So it stayed dormant until 2014, and it was only approved uh, by coincidence as a response from the Brazilian government when it came to know the Snowden revelations. The government was really shocked, and to show the world that we were proactive and progressive when it comes to internet regulation, it decided to take the law out of the, 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 the drawer and approve it in 2014. <laughs> but the law is still being questioned until today. So if, we, if you look at the bills proposed in Congress today, those that were not happy with some results, trade-offs uh, uh, in the negotiations of the law, still propose bill to override some of the articles of, of Marco Civil. And the law is being discussed in the Brazilian judiciary. So now, I think in the beginning of December, the Sup Supreme Court is going to analyze if a particular article is constitutional or, or not which is related to the removal of, of content online only with judicial order, which is an article that is really important to protect freedom of expression, but some people are not happy with that. So some quick lessons that we can take from the process, which I think could be enlightening to the discussion here. Well, first of all, online channels are a great tool for social mobilization for and against proposals, but it's very important to 
meets a negative agenda or meets something that we do not see in the process of digital transformation, for instance, with a positive proposal. Sometimes we just say what we don't want to see, but we don't take a step further and say what we do want to see. For us, it did make a difference to say we don't want the cybercrime bill, we want this bill that will propose rights and responsibilities. So we gave the government a positive agenda that they could substitute the cybercrime bill with. The second <coughs> point is that public participation can be uh, more open. It doesn't need to be so pre-formatted into yes or no questions and parameters that are under the control of the person who is asking the questions. The third point, and I think this is a very important one, the civil rights framework discuss principles and rights. And I think that many times when we discuss digital transformation, artificial intelligence, so on, we talk about values, we talk about ethics, but I completely agree with you that we do need to have some binding frameworks that are legally binding on everyone, that are clear, that we can enforce. And uh, it, there is a value in, in talking about values and, and ethics, but we do not we cannot put human rights, for instance, in the back burner and focus all our attention on values and ethics, which are culturally embedded and, and, and to be honest, a little bit contextual to societies. And the third, the fourth lesson is related to the need for procedures and mechanisms for when the moment in which the traditional democracy meets the new uh, processes. So can we fast track these bills in Congress? Can we create special procedures when they have public support um, when it comes to online consultations? And I think that if we think about the digital society that we want, we usually focus all our attention in the Congress, in, in pol policies and in laws. However, the judiciary in many issues concerning digital aspects is becoming more and more important. If we look at the activity of the European Court of Human Rights, it is taking a stance on issues that range from the gig economy to human rights. So we do need to pay special attention to the role of the judiciary to enforce this branch of government, to provide capacity building to judges. So it is a complementary process that cannot only be focused on norms and laws, which are the key focus of the discussion so far. That were my first remarks, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting, I think also something to take away for the German initiative to see the example of the Brazilian case, uh, which is a bit older. Um, now we, we heard a lot about how it, like citizen engagement and citizen trying to, to shape the digital transformation can work in democratic societies. Um, and we also heard that even there, there is a need for kind of an institutional structure which supports this citizen engagement. I was wondering, Dani, you have done extensive research on, on China and, and Chinese like political participation, uh, polit participation by Chinese citizen. I was wondering how is the situation in China and how can in China or in countries like China citizen make their voices heard when it comes to digital transformation and kind of maybe develop a position which then is also taken into consideration. Thank you, Julia, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really glad to share my research findings uh, with you today. So I've been working on China for the past 20 years, um, mostly on Chinese media and also the development of the internet and social media. And um, I want to start off um, my thoughts on um, Chinese political uses of the internet by saying that I assume that um, any society, no matter whether it's a democratic or non-democratic society can benefit from digital transformation in that especially social media allow uh, states, governments, but also other, other actors, um, uh, companies, but also uh, NGOs to get a glimpse of public opinion. Mm. And of course we know that in um, uh, social media only a very small percentage of people actually post content. Most people lurk into the discussion and China is no exception um, in this case. Um, and in my research I especially looked into what makes people um, post content and voice their opinions about politics. So not so much about what differentiates people from um, just being consumers, passive consumers and observers towards uh, posting content, but specifically what makes people lurk into the political discussion and what makes them then to actually voice their views. Um, and um, uh, in this project, which has been uh, receiving funding from the European Research Council, 
um, I, for the past five years, I've been doing interviews and surveys um, and talking to Chinese average uh, users, but also talking to all the big tech companies in China. And I found out that, um, obviously, one of the key factors is political interest. I mean, that, that, seems, that seems obvious. If you're interested in politics, you're going to be more observant, and you're also more likely to post content. But what's really interesting, and I, th I don't actually think China is so exceptional in this respect, um, there are certain um, social, social norms that also um, provide people with a positive incentive to voice their opinions. And one, um, so one of the key driving forces for people in China um, to uh, voice their political opinions is if they feel appreciated. So if they feel that they get um, a sort of positive feedback and they're recognized, positively recognized for voicing their opinions. Um, interestingly, this is particularly uh, important for women because um, in China, as in many other countries in the world, um, uh, in being interested in politics is a male trait. It's sort of traditionally considered to be um, very positive for men because they take care of the household, but not so much for women. And so we found uh, a very big difference, a very big gender difference in this respect, um, where uh, especially women who are interested in politics say, well, I'm interested in politics, but if I go online, I actually try to hide who I am because my family, if they can observe on social me media what I, what I say, they will say, if you continue to uh, talk so much about politics, you're not going to get a good husband. Um, this brings me to the second really important factor that makes people participate in politics in China, and that has to do, do with privacy. Uh, information about how people can post opinions anonymously without being identified. And um, of course, there are some people who just don't care about privacy at all. So they will just post their opinions no matter what. But then there are other people who are concerned about uh, about privacy, as these women that I just mentioned. And, um, and if they know how to uh, work uh, the technology, um, in order to uh, protect their personal identity, they are more likely to participate. And then the third factor I want to talk about has to do with the tech design of social media platforms. So obviously, social media platforms are um, made with a non-political purpose in mind. So this is the case in China, as in any, as in the U.S. as well. Um, so uh, platforms like, uh, you may have heard about WeChat, which uh, people say it's, a, uh, it's another version of WhatsApp. In fact, it's kind of a mix between Facebook and WhatsApp. But um, this, this social media platform is not completely dominating the Chinese internet. 99% of Chinese internet users are on WeChat, according to my research. <laughs> and um, so, um, so we have done experiments um, sort of online experiments with internet users in China where we uh, found out that uh, people who use a, um, use, uh, a Twitter-like platform, which is called Weibo, Sina Weibo in China, um, uh, it's the same kind of person, so, so similar in terms of gender, in terms of age, education, and so forth, but um, if you post your political views, if you use Weibo, you're much more likely to voice your opinion because there are certain... Um, there's certain um, uh, the, the, the platform is designed in a way to make it less costly to voice your opinion, and the platform is also designed just like Twitter as a platform that helps users to not only voice their opinions but also um, also uh, f um, move their opinion very quickly within an online space to be, to sort of form an online virtual public opinion while uh, WeChat has the opposite trait so it's very costly it's very costly to actually post your opinion and share it with a lot of people and it's also it's while it's very easy to move information into WeChat it's very difficult to move it outside um, of WeChat, for example. So, so this, this leads me very briefly to what I think we can do if we, for a moment, just assume uh, we want people, um, internet users, to actually become more uh, active and more engaged in the politics um, and in these kinds of um, societal um, initiatives that um, both um, 
that earlier speakers have been talking about. Um, so, um, so first of all, I think as ordinary citizens and just as users, we can um, we can actually express some some appreciation for people online who who even if they disagree with us. I know this in, in, in a very polarized political world, this is difficult, but I do think it does make a difference uh, to acknowledge that even if I disagree, it's important that you voice your views and I appreciate that you do that. Um, um, uh, in terms of uh, media literacy trainings, both in school, but so both for young uh, children and teenagers, but also for um, sort of uh, adults, um, I think it is very important to provide very clear and straightforward information trainings to people about how to protect, co how to protect their personal identi identity and their privacy online. Um, and um, so this can be done in schools, but it could also be done by NGOs in collaboration even with tech companies. There are examples of YouTube, where YouTube has been running sort of online campaigns um, in this manner. And then third, I think we can do something in terms of giving positive in incentives for tech companies to, to, even though for tech companies, the main purpose is a financial and, uh, um, interest and a business goal, but from the side of the investors, um, investment can sort of guide innovation in the tech sector towards also taking into consideration their potential political effects that they may have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks. Now we heard about different countries, different initiatives, and actually all of you mentioned something which I thought was very interesting is that the values kind of might be developed or put forward by citizens are very dependable on the context as well. So you talk about privacy in, in China, uh, which is less important than it seems here in Europe. And you heard as well, you talked about the Silicon Valley, that they might have very different ideas about what is a value-based digital transformation. And we heard as well, you said it as well, so uh, Mr. Kings mentioned it as well. So I was wondering, we talk a lot about self-determination as well, that these values should actually help us to develop a way in which people can have a self-determined kind of, that will, can have self-determination in the digital transformation. Um, so I was wondering if self-determination means the same for everyone all around the world. And are these values we are kind of trying to promote are not very kind of European, based, although maybe democracy-based values. Uh, and if this is the case, how can we make sure that kind of we have a similar view, or do we need to make sure that we have a similar view on values around the globe? Um, because especially if you try to develop binding documents, is this something what, what is necessary? Um, so I would like actually to hear your stance on this, this topic about like, is it, where do you think these values come from? Uh, and how do we deal with the fact that people might have very different ideas about this digital transformation should be? And also, the people have like, maybe very like users of the internet, which are used to using it, and, and are, are like very addictive users, have a very different idea of what the self determination in the digital age than non users of the internet. So I, I, I know we are running out of time. I would like to have a discussion with the audience, but I would still like to have a quick round of, of ideas on this topic, uh, if I may. Maybe we start again with uh, Mr. Krings about what's the German government's take on that. It's always difficult to find uh, the German government's statements <laughs> uh, if, if it's uh, a not prepared question, but I think I have uh, my own opinion. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope at least that I can sp uh, talk for the government here. Um, I personally don't like the, the term of value so much, but that's my, pr um, that's my um, personal uh, point of view. It's, I think I'd rather talk about principles, legal principles there, and, and uh, also. Uh, legal rights in, in the end. And of course, uh, different societies of a different cultural makeup um, probably have different views on things or values, if you like. Um, but I think, especially in a time where um, worldwide in, uh, communication is, is easier than it ever was, it would be ridiculous to give up a, a much older idea of, of um, universal rights that people have, no matter in which part of the world they live. Of course, I know that this was always discussed, you know, was this idea of some con colonial powers, but in the end, I think um, the, all the citizens of the world fare better if there is some set of universal rights. Uh, are there legally enforceable rights, or maybe rights more in a moral sense that on the way maybe to a legalization? And um, that doesn't mean that people have to treat the internet uh, and their use of the internet the same way. So there should be a right that you can have, or that you can, can uh, uh, hold on to your privacy, that you can uh, self-determine where your data flows and who 
um, can do what with your data. But of course, you can also, as an, not as a, something against this right, but as an act or as, as using the right, you can decide, of course, as also many people in Germany do, okay, I don't want privacy. I, I open it all up to the, uh, to the public. Sometimes it's a little bit, uh, almost. it seems to me sometimes almost self-contradictory if people are very hesitant and very critical to the government if, if we need some, some data maybe also for, for security issues and the same people, some of them, are uh, really willing um, to open up their, their in, uh, most, in, uh, uh, most personal things um, if it's um, double payback points in, in return or something like that. So, but still, it's a right of people to decide in which way they want to open up themselves, to their personality, give up their data or, 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 or show the data to, to uh, information to other people. And this right has to be with the citizen. This should be universal. That doesn't mean that people have to act in the same way all around the world. Okay, thank you. What do you think about this uh, when it comes to China? Or even from your perspective as a European actually doing research on China, I think that's interesting as well. Okay, I, I think my answer would be much longer than the time I have to answer, but let me just put on my Chinese government head for a moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to talk about my private opinion, but more from a Chinese perspective. I think the current, because China is mentioned so much in this debate as an alternative model to the predominant uh, governance of the internet, but then also more recently, as, you, as some of the speakers mentioned, there is this question about what is a European way and how could a European um, way of governing the internet looks, uh, look like. So from a Chinese government perspective, I, um, the, the, uh, currently the main answer would be um, that any country in the world has the right uh, to um, follow their own path. And this right is, uh, sort of precedes all these other rights. Um, so, uh, so in China currently there is, a, um, a, it, this, this right is um, sort of uh, the priority before everything else. As you know, China has separated itself from the rest of the world. There's a great Chinese firewall. And also Chinese citizens don't have a say in this matter, I have to say. So this is a government, this was a government decision in the 19th 1990s, and they don't have. Um, they, 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 the, 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 the assumption is that the government knows what citizens want, and therefore move China into a certain direction. But then, when we think about self-determination uh, internally, in terms of what can citizens actually do to then influence what is happening within the Chinese internet, I do think that um, companies and also so Chinese society has much more a self-determinatory power currently than is often recognized. Interesting. Yep. yep. Thank you. Um, moving to this side, um, who of you, I, th I think it's, it's very interesting to have a conversation about these two different frameworks uh, in particular, uh, but I also I would actually like to know from the Brazilian perspective, I mean, I would guess that the many of the principles in Marco Civil kind of overlap, for example, with the principles you will find in, in the German or the European initiative. So I was also wondering from your perspective, what do you see how much culturally embedded are these norms that might be put forward by citizens in different parts of the world? Well, I think that if we, if we think about a Western society, there are many things that we would find in common between European initiatives and what we see in Marco Civil what we see being developed as a debate in, in, in improving privacy norms in the US, for instance. So there's a cultural matrix that unifies us. The problem, I think, with using values as a term is that to me, it, it's an empty vessel. Different societies will feel it, different, it, it differently in a more individual level. Different individuals will have uh, different uh, values. So I think it's a, it's a dif difficult concept to work with. When we are talking among, let's say, Western, uh, countries, it is much more productive if we can move from values to actually what we mean and embed this in, in rights. I do see uh, value in talking about ethics and values when we try to bridge cultural bridges because for historical reasons, when we talk about human rights and we approach countries like China, for instance, they feel like, okay, here comes the West to bash us on human rights. So there's a barrier that tu -tu 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 is raised there and the conversation does not happen. So if values is used as a starting point that we can build upon in a more neutral ground with non-Western countries, I think there's a value on that. But then we need to move forward from that when we build a minimal level of understanding. But I find the second part of your, of your comment very interesting about self-determination mm -hmm. and what it could mean in different, in different uh, countries. Because from my perspective, when you look at a country that has huge problems with internet access, 
and to access basic functions. Self-determination is to be able to access them, mm -hmm. and period. Mm -hmm. If you go to other countries, then self-determination is moving towards more empowerment and real control over what you do when you are online and what companies do with you or to you or with your data when you are online. So there is a, there is a different perspective when you look at different uh, realities uh, like, this, like that. But uh, I think that digital literacy is the only way in, in every country because what I feel right now is that opaqueness <coughs> is growing under a certain appearance of transparency. We have lots of information available, but if we look at how algorithms are ruling our societies, if we look at the way that different companies are merging different sectors of the digital economy and taking control of them mm -hmm. and managing them from headquarters that are, that are somewhere else, the, society, the digital society is becoming more and more opaque, and the only way that we can make sense out of it will be through digital literacy, and that needs to, to, to be in place everywhere. Some countries are more advanced than others, but I do feel that every country still has a long way to go when it comes to educating citizens to this new digital mm. world. Thank you. Um, Self-determination is also a very important point, I think, in the initiative you developed, which is also, I think, an interesting thing, because it was developed by Germans, right? So most of the Germans, or all of the German, uh, all of the, the experts Germans, involved German-speaking, German, not all Germans. Yeah, German-speaking. Well, OK, different German countries. <laughs> German-speaking, but still it's proposed on the European level. Also, yeah. So you assume that kind of there is a cultural kind of common vision about what kind of values, principles, and norms you want to have within Europe. So uh, what is actually in there, what you think is um, mm. a European-based mm. principles and values? Or mm. how do you see this? Well, first of all, just one short remark to Marco Seville, because this was very really an inspiring source to our project. Mm. So we totally recognize this, and also that you had a political momentum with the Snowden files that made, made it happen and legally binding. So I'm still looking for this momentum to come up for us here in Europe or internationally. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be a scandal. Um, yeah, as you said, um, this is, of course, culturally embedded. And we, have, we would like to move forward and make it more internationally, but um, I would totally defend, as um, Mr. Krink said at the beginning, that we have come up with certain values that are in the, uh, at the highest level in the human, in, uh, human rights charter, and we should not uh, give, um, uh, stick, uh, we should not give them up. Um, so I use this word to, to um, Western values. Um, and this charter, uh, we have the copies because I cannot go through all the paragraphs, but the, the whole concept is based or deducted from the European fun Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is pretty close to the German Grundgesetz and also to the Human Rights Charter. And so, for example, the first paragraph, to, just to name one, um, basically says, um, that human dignity is untouchable also in the digital context. And for some, this sounds like just a pathetic word, but um, it, if this is binding, it has huge influence, for example, on how we design AI processes, how self-driving cars will decide when they are on the streets, how in a conflict situation. Um, and. When I was in America now, um, we talked a lot with human rights organizations in, in the US context because, of course, they have a totally different understanding about f free speech. We, <coughs> both of our countries agree on we need free speech, but what this means uh, uh, practically, we have a different understanding. And so my idea or the idea of this charter process, not just the text, but the process is that this is a great opportunity between our Western countries of free democracies to negotiate what these values mean in the digital context. And this is what we wanted to give a starting point on. And if, if you go through these 18 articles, it's, it's basically 18 articles condensed with, uh, with these kind of principles from plurality protection, participation, rights, a free access to the internet, security, privacy, transparency, freedom of expressions. I just browsed the titles. They are all, I, I would say, the precondition of self-determination and 
freedom of expression in a democratic society. So we have to bring these kind of values or given rights in the digital context to exactly create what, you, uh, what we are all looking for, um, free self-determination in the digital sphere or era. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, um, less than I had hoped for, but I would still like to invite the audience because, I mean, we are here at the Internet Governance Forum, which is an international conference. Uh, we had now a very Western perspective, except for Danny's uh, research on China, which was very interesting as well. But I, I would like to actually invite you to, to ask questions or make comments about this idea of citizens promoting certain ideas, norms, ethical values, and so on, and how they can make their voices heard. So if you'd like to come to the microphones, which are in the middle here, um, please come forward. I would like to ask you to make, keep it short, so we can have a couple of questions and a round of answers. And if you have a question directed to a particular person, please uh, tell us as well. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> Hello. I'm Mm -hmm. Yes, it's on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here it is. I'm Jennifer Boucher from R&W Media. Uh, we're based in the Netherlands, and we build digital communities for social change. Um, I have a question for the panel. I would like to know if the discussion on values is being intimately connected to analysis and critique of the business model of big tech, because uh, one of the worries I have is, of course, you have an industry that glamorizes exposure of private lives and actually monetizes that. Uh, and also uh, makes it very difficult to express casual, constructive dialogue rather than polarizing dialogue. So I'm curious to, to hear your views on that. Thank you. Perfect. I will actually take a second question and then have a round of answers. So, so please go ahead. Uh, They're yes. very low. You can yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Fernando. I'm from Brazil also. And my question goes to Marilia. And uh, when the Marco Civil was formulated, fake news wasn't, and misinformation online wasn't something really on the topic of society conversation. But right now in Brazil, we have a parliamentary commission extremely politicized discussing fake news. Uh, what's your opinion on more engagement of civil society on this topic and how it can make changes to the actual framework or some, or do you think there is no, uh, in this actual government, there is no uh, kind of capillarity to enter this topic uh, right now? Thank you. So let's we'll start with the first question. Anyone of you in particular would like to react? Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a very um, important issue that we not only focusing on maybe authoritarian, authoritarian uh, or dictator-like uh, uh, governments and states that uh, kind of infringe with uh, free, free speech or with, with some of these values or principles we discussed, but we also have to look at um, the big tech companies and how they influence, and, as you, and you mentioned this. And uh, I don't want to oversimplify, but maybe simplify it. Uh, saying, I think, who's now strong in the control of, of internet, of, of discussion forums? I think authoritarian states, yes, they're strong. And big tech companies, they're strong. On the weak side, they are democratic states and um, civil society. So I think it's, it's rather obvious that uh, civil society and democratic states should team up and say, uh, you know, what do we have to do to also to have a more decent and more meaningful communication uh, on the internet, uh, um, uh, maybe not a less pro-lized uh, pro uh, uh, communication, do something about fake news and so on. And that's why also regulation has to affect um, and, and to focus also on, on big tech companies that we did in the uh, network enforcement uh, law in Germany. It was also criticized from some people active uh, in, in the internet community, but I think it was at least going in the right direction. We're now planning to do an update. And there are similar projects, uh, or uh, somewhat similar projects, also at least discussed on the European, on the European level and other, other European countries, and maybe even, even beyond. So I think um, that's certainly a point. Um, of course, we can talk here about values as a starting point, but then it, they have to materialize in some kind of regulation. But also, as you mentioned, it was, I think, quite interesting in <coughs> how we as, as users also interact. Uh, your, your first mentioning of, of, the, of the Brazilian uh, document was, it's about rights, but also about duties or maybe responsibilities of the citizens. So we also have to ask ourselves, what can we contribute? Of course, we can lament on these internet forums to be places where the quality of communication, the, um, the, the style of communication is rather bad, but we could also make a contribution, but just that decent people and, and uh, people with some 
some less inclination to proletarianization, also do also participate and are part of, of, of the scene and not just go away and walk away and say, oh, this is so bad, I don't want to ha um, have anything of that. So our personal behavior out of civil society is certainly something, but also government regulation when it comes to the big tech companies. Of course, it's now a very superficial answer, but at least uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe partly at least addresses uh, the topic you raised. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, you just mentioned initially you had a conversation in Silicon Valley just recently, so maybe that's something you... Yeah, but also, yeah. yes, uh, uh, exactly on this point, but also f in when this charter was first published, maybe the most controversial point was, I, I just said, we deducted some points that are already in the existing charters to the digital age. We added some new aspects, and maybe the most controversial aspect was um, and it was our argument that we need to talk about the scope of digital rights. As you in the UN context know that usually fundamental rights are between um, persons, um, citizens, and towards the state to enforce, uh, get their right. Um, but um, we said we have to expand, or the charter argues we have to expand these rights towards also non-state actors, uh, formerly known as big tech companies, as soon as they become so powerful in their field that they de facto actually uh, fulfill public service kind functions in a society. Of course, then they have to be accountable, uh, also in context of such kind of documents. This is the breakthrough argument of this charter. Of, and as you mentioned, Silicon Valley, we thought that this will, will be, when we publish it, heavily criticized by the tech companies. <coughs> it was not. It was uh, criticized by lawyers, especially in Germany. For them, this concept of Drittwirkung um, is still very new in the international context. It's, it's also very far in, in the discussion, but, but it is still a novum. Um, but when we talk with some big tech companies now in Silicon Valley, they said, of course, we, we like this idea because then we have a continuous document at a certain stage <coughs> that we can stick to. The worst for our business models are segmented rules, rules that change every year by every new government and so on. So even if this in the first hand will hurt us a little, maybe a little <coughs> bit, <laughs> but on the long term, it is a good approach. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, if I have a cold. Um, <laughs> quickly, you, before we move on to Maria for the last the question. Yes. Yeah. So in my opinion, there is a direct link to the business models of social media and some of the phenomena that are recently uh, described as sort of harmful content online. So give, taking fake news as an example, a lot of fake news are actually not produced for political purposes. Um, but they're produced for fun in order to reap the benefits of um, users clicking on interesting headlines that sound outrageous. Um, that's called the clickbait phenomenon. And that is directly linked to the business model of social media companies because they, um, uh, they have an interest in creating more traffic online and obtaining more data, which they then most of the time can sell um, um, to marketing companies, for example, in order um, to uh, post their ads. So, um, so I currently I have a I'm starting a research project. If you have any thoughts on that, um, and, and if you're also working on this connection with the business model, I'm very happy to link up. Um, and I also have a group of students who will work on these topics for the public consultation phase of the Digital Services Act early next year. Right. Thank you. So citizen engagement, ask here, right? Um, so my, yeah. Well, actually, I think the last comment was a, a good first part of the answer on fake news, because we cannot tackle only on legal terms the problem of fake news. We need to see the economic model that is feeding and the development of fake news, too. But more specifically on Marcos' view, it's true that when the law was approved in 2014, the debate on fake news was not so much in the public eye. However, the context that motivated the cybercrime bill and other bills in Brazil, they were much more related to um, crimes, related to the image, to exposure of photos of people, um, famous people, public people that were not uh, 
um, allowed to be posted online. So there was already a framework of discussion of, of the rights of the person to tweet on image. So the debate was already there when the law was, was approved. And uh, Article 19, as we stand right now, uh, it means that if the, pub, the platform, let's say Facebook, for instance, comes across content that goes against its terms of use, and it's clear that fake news does go against, it could remove the content. And many platforms such as Facebook are investing in technologies such as artificial intelligence to detect and quickly remove uh, fake news. Um, Article 19 says that the company is not obliged to take down the content if there is no judicial order. And that is really important because if you think about small blogs, for instance, that if, if that article was not there, that could have a tremendous chilling effect on small bloggers that afraid to be legally prosecuted would take down any content that they received a complaint about. So it does protect freedom of expression. So I think that in Marcos view, we already have the right checks and balances when, we, when it comes to uh, image crimes, uh, fake news. Um, so it's already there. And I would tend to think that this would be a sort of delicate moment, politically speaking, as you mentioned, um, to introduce uh, changes to, to, to views that were progressive that we have in Brazil. Unfortunately, my country is an example how um, values can be very contextual. The, the values that are being promoted by the government right now are completely different from the values that were promoted in 2014 when Marco Civil got approved. So I think that reopening um, this debate now would be a little bit dangerous. Uh, however, I do think that Marco Civil does provide us with a good set of legal tools to face uh, this problem, <coughs> and I hope that the Article 19 will stand after the trial in the Supreme Court that will take place in December. I hope that they decide by the constitutionality of this particular article. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would love to continue the discussion, but I, also we don't have anyone queuing up anymore at the microphones. So I would like to thank the panel, and I think most of them will be around for the entire week. So if you have <coughs> personal questions, I'm sorry. You can still approach them during the ITF. Um, so I will thank you all, and uh, you, all of you, and I would uh, I'd like to wish you a very interesting and successful IGF week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants a copy of the charter here or some leaflets? <laughs> <coughs>
de vraag is te stellen aan de, aan de, uh, de overheid. Ja, dat is hetzelfde. Dat is hetzelfde. Ja. Helemaal hetzelfde. Ja. 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 Ik heb ook een um, omvraag gedaan over, Sinead, over uh, waar wij ook hebben gevraagd in de migranten. En ook, uh, ja, dat is een, een soort nationaal representatieve. Uh, om vraag in China, dus misschien is het ook uh, interessant voor jou als je over, ja, over migranten naar denkt. Ja, ja, ja. 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 ik vind het fijn ja. ja. En als je die niet kunnen fijn vinden, dan kun je op mij altijd ook een video zien. Ja, ja, ja. 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 leuk. Oh, your next event. Okay, then I will move to the side. Okay, to make space. <laughs> ja, aber haben Sie noch eine übrig für mich? Ja, wollte ich gerade sagen. Darf ich sogar beide nehmen? Ja, klar, gerne. Ja, super, gerne. Ja. Okay, dann kann ich die heute ja, noch stimmt, weiter. Wir kannten uns bis jetzt ja, leider, nicht. Wir sollten genau. das aber ändern. Ja, das finde ich auch. Also, ich finde es sehr schön, dass wir das auch beide vielleicht. Ja. Okay. Your panel. Two here and two there, would that be okay? Sure. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't think that anybody has any specific idea, so feel free to choose whatever. <laughs> Do we know when we should start? I mean, should we start? Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Niklas Forgo. I am the chair of this session. We have one hour to debate a very, very legally challenging, but also technically challenging topic with four highly distinguished speakers. I will therefore reduce my uh, presentation at the beginning to the absolute minimum just to orientate you about the order of appearance and then leave the floor uh, to the four speakers. There's one rule here, which is that this is to be a very, very common experience and exercise, which means that you are kindly invited to intervene whenever you want to do so. If you want to do so, please kindly give me a sign so that I can give you the floor. There are microphones all over in the room. Uh, it would be very polite of you if you briefly mentioned from where you come before you start to intervene. So the four speakers today in the order of appearance, which is not the alphabetical order, will be Alexandra Jour Schröder, right from my side here. She is the deputy director general from the DG Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. As at least the lawyers in the room certainly know, there has been quite some debate within Europe uh, on the topic uh, in the last years, uh, in particular because of a proposal of a regulation that is still in the making, and she will certainly give us an, an, an insight on what Europe is doing at the moment. 
Then we go to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Professor Jennifer Dascal, who is Associate Professor of Law at uh, American University in Washington, uh, at the College of Law there and at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She will give us a perspective in particular on the U.S. Cloud Act and in how far the U.S. Cloud Act has an impact on the debate um, as it's ongoing in, ongoing in Europe. Then we go back to Europe, uh, Ulrich Kelber, the Germans in the room are certainly very familiar with the name because he is at the moment the German Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. So he, is, he represents the German authority uh, in the field of data protection and will certainly speak about the role of data protection authorities from a European point of view, not only from a German point of view. Um, um, on, on, on the subject, and then s finally, Sofia Jaramillo-Otoya, so, sorry if I pronounce any of the names wrongly, I'm very sorry for this,